cool. Um, and especially because these things are going to be put online, I think it's sort of tempting for people to be like, oh, I'll just watch the video later, whatever. You know, like I said, I've said before, and I, I think it's really true. One thing that I learned about myself that was really important is my brain is lazy as shit. Like, I'll put off a task and be like, oh, I'll just do that later. No, it doesn't really work like that, right? So just make sure your butt is in the seat at, you know, from 1 to 2.15 on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and you will be doing yourself a huge favor in terms of the amount of work and effort you're going to have to put into this class, right? Just by virtue of showing up, you've dedicated now those two hours. Uh, that's about as good as you can do, okay? So yeah, so I know that it's easy to sort of check out, especially now that we're all at home and this has this oddly relaxed feeling being online class, uh, but we want to finish strong here. Um, and then just note, final exam. So the time, uh, date and time is set, right? So Thursday the 21st um, and at our normal class time, one, two, and then it actually goes until uh, 250. So it's a two hour exam, okay? <laughs> All right, so like I said, let's just jump back into this. We actually started chapter 18 last time, but of course that feels like it was a million years ago. So let's just refresh ourselves as to what we've actually been doing. All right, so chapter 18, now we're actually talking about benzene and the chemical reactions that benzene undergoes, right? We sort of hadn't been paying much attention to benzene up until this point. Um, and everything that we learned were these electrophilic aromatic substitutions. Okay, so these were all reactions where benzene is going to be playing the role of what? Nucleophile or electrophile? Nucleophile. Nucleophile, awesome, right? So benzene and these reactions are our nucleophile. That pair of electrons in the benzene ring is what's going to jump out and grab that electrophile. And then these are, so these, all of these reactions that we saw, they undergo the same sort of generic reaction mechanism. You have your electrophile that gets attacked by the benzene ring. Notice that that creates a carbocation on that next door neighbor carbon. And then the last step is going to be the elimination where you're gonna remove that hydrogen and reform your aromatic benzene ring, right? So these are substitution reactions. We're substituting a hydrogen for whatever our electrophile is. We learned about five different electrophiles, either a halogen, they can be a nitration reaction, a sulfonation reaction. Anybody remember what we would call this guy? This is our... Acyl? Acyl, yeah, so an acylation reaction. And then this R is just gonna represent an alkyl group, right? So an alkylation as well. So these were the five different air, uh, electrophilic aromatic substitution reactions that we learned. Again, they all follow this same sort of generic reaction mechanism. There was one thing that was tricky about these five different reactions, the, the, the hard part here, right? How they react with benzene, that's the easy part. The hard part is how you prepare the electrophile, how you, what they call generate the electrophile, okay? Benzene is a nucleophile in these reactions, as you can see with the uh, Curviero mechanism stuff, right? It's not a good nucleophile though. So in order to get it to react, we have to have a very good electrophile. So the tricky part of these five reactions is not how it reacts with benzene. That's pretty straightforward. It's the same for all of them. It's how you prepare the electrophile. All right, so let's just review how we did that real quick because it was a little bit different for each one of these. So first of all, in the case of our halogenation, all right, so this would be our halogenation reactions. The key player here, the catalyst, is the iron three bromide. Okay, What's that, what that's doing is it's going to inter, uh, interact with your bromine, your Br2, in such a way that makes the bromine an even better electrophile. So all you have is the bromine reacting with the iron 3 bromide to create this sort of complex right here. And the key thing here is that now this bromine on the very end is an even better electrophile than it was before, right? Again, all of these are about generating that electrophile, making this a really, really good electrophile because we have a pretty crappy nucleophile. Um, for the nitration, let's see how that went down. Okay, so first of all, this is now the 
nitration. And that would be putting a nitro group, that NO2, onto your benzene ring. So again, we got to generate that electrophile. This happens in the presence of an acid catalyst, right? So you have your sulfuric acid here. And what that's really going to do is protonate the oxygen on your nitric acid. So if we zoom in here, this is sort of the key step here. Now we have this good leaving group that can pop off, right? So water will leave as a leaving group and we'll be left with our nitronium ion, right? Now it's got that positive charge, so it's a really good electrophile. So that nitronium ion is what's actually going to react with the uh, benzene ring. Okay. Just going down the line here, the next one will be the sulfonation reaction. Okay, and actually these two, I sort of want you to keep lumped together in your mind. How we prepare the electrophile for this nitronium ion is the exact same as how we prepare it for the sulfonation, creating this sulfonium ion. Again, you have an acid catalyst. It's gonna protonate, whoops, one of the oxygens, all right? So we have sulfuric acid reacting with itself. Now we have protonated one of those oxygens. That makes this a good leaving group. So that will pop off and you're left with your sulfonium ion, which is what's actually going to be reacting with the benzene ring. Okay. Um, again, just maybe because it helps to have it in your mind what these things actually look like. This sulfonium ion will look as so. Okay, and then the benzene ring can then go and attack that sulfur because it's even better electrophile now. So again, keep those nitration and sulfonation reactions kind of grouped together in your mind. They're very similar. The last two, you can also sort of keep grouped in your mind. We'll see why in a second. First is going to be these acylation reactions. And these are also going to be, you know, they're named after the two dudes who came up with them, Friedel and Kraft. These require the aluminum chloride catalyst. Okay, so both of these next two reactions are gonna involve the uh, aluminum chloride. And what we're gonna see is that aluminum chloride effectively just plucks off that chlorine. All right, so here with our acyl chloride, we have the, uh, what happens is the chlorine actually reaches over and grabs that aluminum. Remember that's because currently aluminum only has six electrons in its octet, so it accepts that pair of electrons and gets a full eight. This creates this sort of complex here, and then the chlorine gets severed off, right? So this bond is effectively broken here, and we're left with the acylium ion. So this acylium ion, it's, you know, now you just have, let's sort of draw it out here. But now there's a positive charge on that carbon. Right, so again, the whole ice shtick is that we were generating a good electrophile. Again, the aluminum chloride, what it's doing is removing that chlorine, leaving you with a carbocation. Uh, we call it an acylium ion because the carbon that has that positive charge is what's, uh, is a carbonyl carbon, okay? Um, one of the things to keep in mind about these acylium ions is that unlike other carbocations, that you won't have any hydride ships. Right, the acylium ion is actually stabilized uh, through resonance of that carbonyl group. All right, and then the last reaction is an alkylation. So we're adding an alkyl group on there. Again, um, aluminum chloride is gonna be the key player here, our catalyst. You start off with an, um, an alkyl halide, so just in, alkane that has a chlorine on there. And again, what that aluminum chloride is doing is just removing that chlorine, right? So this, again, you form this sort of uh, comp uh, coordinated compound in the middle here that then uh, that chlorine alkyl bond is broken to generate a carbocation. Unlike the acylium ions, these are prone to hydride shifts, okay? So just, um, something that you always sort of want to have in the back of your mind with these types of reactants here, right? So if you have a primary alkyl halide, that's 1000% going to rearrange uh, through hydride shift. And again, you can sort of lump 
these two reactions in your mind because they both involve that aluminum chloride and that aluminum chloride is sort of playing the same role in both of these. Okay, so this is all we, this is just a good summary of what we, um, so sorry, so these would be acylation and alkylation. Okay, so this is just a summary of these electrophilic aromatic substitution reactions. That's what we did last time um, when we sort of kicked off chapter 18. Okay, uh, one other thing that we sort of ended with was just reminding everybody that we actually already found, uh, learned about two different ways that we can alkylate benzene rings. We did this in all the way back in chapter 11 in our organometallics chapter, and that is the Suzuki reaction or the Gilman's, both of which will react with um, what were called aryl chlorides or aryl bromides, aryl halides. Uh, but this is just yet another way that we can alkylate those benzene rings. Okay. So that's what we did last time. So that was just a quick cra cl in a crash course of everything that we went over last chapter, uh, last chapter, last lecture. Okay. So moving on. So we got a few other random reactions to talk about here. First of all, this would have been all the way, what, what the heck is this H nu doing for us? What is H nu? Light. Light, right? So this is going to be a reaction that's catalyzed by light. Does anybody remember what kind of reaction these were? So this would have been all the way back in chapter 12 when we were talking about radicals. Uh, the one right? So what light does is help to create a bromine radical. And how would that react with this particular, this propyl benzene here? It would split, do like a, a, a what you call it, split, homolytic split. Yeah, so it does, but, but with one of these carbon-hydrogen bonds is then what it replaces, right? So this is also, these were substitution reactions. Remember, bromine is very specific in that it wants to react with the more highly substituted carbon, okay? Um, so this is just one way, another way that you can brominate, not the actual benzene ring itself, but this is now replacing what would be called the benzylic hydrogen, or that one removed from the ring. Um, NBS, we also learned about in that chapter. This is just another way to brominate. Does anybody remember what you should be like, what should come to mind when we hear NBS? It was kind of a weird one. Get base? Base? Bang and base or no? No, not bang and base. NBS is, it's just going to brominate, but this is, so let's just remind everybody. This is how you would brominate the allylic carbon. So, right, the one, one removed from a double bond, that's what NBS is doing for you. Okay, so just something to sit, right? I mean, at some point we're gonna have this final exam, so keep these things in mind. That was, NBS was sort of special in that that's what it did. It allowed you to put a bromine one removed from a double bond, right? So, um, and similarly, when we have a benzylic hydrogen, such as the case here. We don't really consider that to be allylic, but it's, it's got the same effect, right? So it doesn't actually brominate the ring itself. It brominates one of the uh, hydrogens on the carbon outside the ring. Okay. Um, so these, you know, may sort of seem weird, but the reason why these are really powerful is of course we have other tools that we can do once we have alkyl halides. So for example, what's gonna happen if I mix this compound with hydroxide, what type of reaction do I, will I have? Alcohol. Yeah, right, so this is just gonna be substitution type reactions, right? When the, when the actual bromine is on the ring, those aren't prone to substitution reactions. We learned about why that was with sp2 hybridized carbons back, back in those substitution chapters. But now when you're, one, now when you're outside of the ring, those uh, bromine groups are prone to substitution, right? So these can be, go so this would create, you're absolutely right, an alcohol group. Um, 
likewise, I could have just another nuclear. I mean, there's any sort of like one of many nucleophiles we could choose here, but bottom line is that these are all going to be prone to these substitution reactions, nucleophilic substitution reactions. So although uh, your end goal might not be this halogenated product here, it's a good intermediate step. Okay, so this is a good sort of intermediate. These two reactions here are good intermediate steps in multi-step synthesis reactions. So just to sort of finish off my notes here, if I were to tout, uh, have that nitrile group or cyanide ion, that would also substitute out that bromine. And yeah. Um, likewise, what would happen if I took this compound here and did something like tert butoxide. You're gonna get alkene? I'm gonna get an alkene, yeah, right? So this is gonna be, uh, now promote these elimination reactions. All right, so now I'm gonna have a double bond here. How many carbons? One, two, three. All right, so again, um, these are just good two reactions that would are going to be commonly used as intermediate steps in a multi-step synthesis type of reaction. Okay. Um, all right. So then that that's sort of like how we prep our uh, prep for substitution reactions. Now let's talk about some reduction reactions. What we're basically going to find is that it's really hard to reduce the actual benzene ring itself. Okay, so we all know at this point that H2 and a palladium catalyst are good reducing agents. But if we sort of mix these in with what we have, we'd see that they reduce that alkene, they reduce this guy here, but they do not actually reduce the benzene ring itself. Okay, um, likewise, these nitro groups, we actually saw this in lab when we were working with luminol, but we didn't really talk about it too much. These nitro groups can also be reduced to, al uh, no, sorry, um, amine groups. All right, does anybody remember what we call this guy? This is one of these ones that we just have to know. So let's sort of start practicing this. Was it a meal? Something like yeah, that? Yeah, close. Aniline, aniline actually. All right, so these are just one of those substituted benzene rings that you're just gonna have to know. Um, another good one just to sort of practice here. What do we call it when there's an OH group? Phenol? Yeah, phenol. Okay, so again, these are just sort of, unfortunately, things that you gotta have memorized. All right, so, and this is actually, this is Rainey's. The one way that you can actually reduce the benzene ring itself is with rainy nickel at high temperatures. Okay, so this will actually reduce all of those double bonds in the benzene ring, creating cyclohexane. But you sort of got to go to like extreme measures, not only using your best reducing agent rate, rainy nickel, but also doing so at high temperatures. So again, just note that these palladium type catalysts won't reduce the benzene ring. If that's our goal is to create cyclohexane, we really got to go out of our way with rainy nickel and high temperatures. What would be the benefit in doing this in like a multi-step? I mean, I, if for whatever reason your desire was to have a cyclohexane, or maybe you want to have some sort of a substituted cyclohexane. So you start with a benzene ring, you know ways that you can do these electrophilic aromatic substitutions, and then you can go and reduce the whole thing. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, it would, it would really depend on what you wanted at the end goal. Like I can't think of a situation off the top of my head where I'm dying to have like, cyclohexanol or something like that. But if that is what your goal is, we, we sort of have a way to do that now. Um, I will say, you know, if you did start out with cyclohexane, it's, it's not that difficult to, I guess you could always treat it with, uh, yeah, you could do your, um, what's it called? The radical reactions, you could brominate it, but yeah, I, I don't, 
I, I can't think of off the top of my head like a practical use for why, but if we are trying to reduce it, it's it's rather difficult, point being. Oh, yeah. All right, so now we'll go the other way, oxidation. These are somewhat counterintuitive. Um, so first of all, if we want to oxidize, if we stick our, so remember this is like our best oxidizing agent here, our strongest oxidizing agent here, okay? Um, we're used to seeing alcohol groups being oxidized to carboxylic acids or ketones or something like that here, right? So this is a little bit weird because we don't have any existing oxygens on our starting compound here, okay? So first of all, this is another one that you just gotta know the answer, the name of, toluene, okay, when there's a methyl group on the benzene ring. So this is going to be oxidized where all of those benzylic hydrogens, remember what makes it a benzylic hydrogen is when it's one removed from the benzene ring. All right, that's going to be the key here is that any sort of benzylic hydrogens are then going to be oxidized all the way to a carboxylic acid. Okay, and this is true even if it's not necessarily just a methyl group sticking off of there, but also these two here also get fully oxidized. All right, so this is a little weird. The only requirement is there has to be a benzylic hydrogen. So an example of something that will not get oxidized is if you have a tertiary carbon there will be no reaction here. All right, but prime methyl primary secondary carbons, benzylic carbons will all be oxidized all the way to a carboxylic acid. The only ones that don't are tertiary benzylic carbons. And again, benzylic means one removed from that benzene ring. Uh, this isn't something that we have a mechanism for or anything like that. Just something that you gotta know. Um, can anybody tell me what this guy's called? Benzoic acid. Nice, yep. Awesome. Okay, so those are our oxidize, uh, oxidation reactions with the benzene ring. Notice that the actual benzene ring itself is not touched, right? It's just the alkyl groups that are uh, decorating the outside there. Okay. So now everything that we had talked about before with substitution reactions, we're all starting with like a naked benzene ring. All right, now we're gonna start talking about the effect that like having a substituent on there, what role that plays. All right, before we can get into that, we gotta know how to name these things, okay? Before we actually like jump into that, so first of all, in terms of our strategy of how we're gonna learn how to name these things. First, we're gonna talk about things that have two substituents on there, and then we'll graduate to more in a second. But now we're just talking about benzene rings that have two substituents. Key things that we have to know are these vocab words here, ortho, meta, and para. All right. So let's start with the benzene ring here. Let's say that I have something there. Okay, one of my positions is substituted. The ortho positions, are on either side of whatever your original substituent is, right? So both of the, all three, let's actually take a step back. All three of these designate how far your two groups are from one another on the ring. So if it's ortho, that means that these two substituents are located directly next to each other on that benzene ring. Meta is one removed, so there's a carbon in between them. And then para is the site located on the opposite side of the ring. All 
Um, these, in terms of naming, these would actually be a part of like the common names of things. Those vo these vocab words are more important than that because we're going to start talking about like meta directing reactions where the substituent that's going to be substituted is going to be in the meta position and ortho directing reactions, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So having an idea of what these words actually mean in terms of position is really important. Uh, how I remember it is like O M P kind of like say it to yourself, like a Valley girl saying O M G O M P. Right. And that's the order in which they are spaced from the benzene ring. Okay, that's how I remember it. It works pretty well. All right, but again, so sort of knowing those positions, not only for naming them, but also more importantly for when we just start talking, we're gonna use it in our vocabulary and you gotta, you gotta sort of be able to recall what that is pretty easily. Okay. Um, okay, so now let's go into sort of how we actually name these things. When you have multiple substituents on your benzene ring, you're just gonna put them in alphabetical order. So whichever one comes first in alphabetical order, that gets to be carbon one. And then remember, we're always gonna number in such a way that we're, we come up with the smallest numbers at the end, right? So in this particular compound here, chlorine comes before iodo in terms of uh, alphabetical order. So this is carbon one, two, three. So the you know, official IUPAC name would be one chloro, three iodo benzene. But then notice how this sort of ortho para meta uh, business comes into play here. You could also say meta chloro iodo benzene, right? That meta implying that they're one apart, that there's a carbon in between those two. So okay. should we practice it both ways then? Um, so, you know, like if I gave you this structure and uh, you gave me either one of those names on the exam, that would be fine. I wouldn't ask you for both of them. But of course, if I gave you the meta chloro iodo benzene, you would want to know what that means. And again, I think more importantly is for when we start talking about reactions, having an idea of what that means. We're going to start talking about meta directing substitution reactions, right? So like just knowing those vocab words are important beyond nomenclature. I like IUPAC. I kind of would stick to that. But again, those words are going to come up more when we're talking about reaction types. So in other places than just nomenclature. Will they be uh, more common on the final test? Uh, what is it? The state test? I have no idea. Okay. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen it yet. All right. Um, in terms of nomenclature of benzene on the ACS exam, again, like the nice thing is I'm going to get to be able to pick uh, the problems. I think benzene is kind of stupid in its nomenclature more than other groups when it's the parent chain and not the parent chain, I think is a little bit confusing. So I'm going to tend to pick the easier ones of those. Um, but yeah, I, again, beyond nomenclature, these, this ortho meta para business is important. So knowing what those mean is very important. Okay. All right. So then let's pick another one here. So again, just sort of to pick this apart here, we have an ethyl group and a chloro group. Chloro comes first in alphabetical order. So this gets to be carbon one, two, three, four. So one chloro, four ethyl benzene. Of course, also because they're located on opposite sides of the ring, that means that they are para. So I could have called this para, para chloro ethyl benzene as well. So the common name refers to the, uh, like the, the one that doesn't have priority, right? The one that's on like- No, no, four, common, three. so the difference between the IUPAC name and the common name is really um, about like prevalence and adoption, right? So by, you know, IUPAC is just a group of scientists that got together and say, we need to standardize how we name things, right? Problem is, is that these things, especially benzene rings, were in use way before IUPAC ever existed. So when you go to the back in the stock room, especially if you grab an old bottle of this compound, it's not gonna be labeled one uh, chloro three iota benzene, it's gonna be meta chloro iota. So basically the common name just means that you're gonna see it a bunch when you actually step into the lab. All right, it's something that's just like already gotten ingrained into the chemistry vocabulary a long time ago. All right, so then now, um, 
these three examples at the top, they were all involving benzene rings that didn't already have one of those special names. So down at the bottom here, what we're gonna see, remember that this chunk here, we already have a special name for, right? This is the aniline. And so in both the common and the IUPAC name, that aniline is still going to be in there, right? So this is now 4-nitroaniline or paranitroaniline, right? So notice that if, you, if it has one of those special names like aniline, that group right there is what gets carbon number one. It's more or less like the higher priority group. All right, and again, it's, it's, it's a little bit tricky because we had, you know, it wasn't, it's not just that it was like, I don't know, we had a special name for it already. So uh, everybody take a second and see if you can't give me the name of this compound here. Remembering that we already had a special name for this chunk. All right, so remember that chunk there we called, that was a phenol. So this would be 2-ethylphenol or orthoethylphenol. All right. So see if you can do these two last examples as well. Give me the structure of 2-chloromethylbenzene. Oh, and actually this one, this is, another sort of special case scenario. So I'll, I'll do that one with you guys. But take a second and go the other way. Give me the structure of this compound. Okay, um, I wish I had a good reason for why this is, but I don't. This chunk right here would have been toluene, toluene, but we still designate the chloro and the methyl group separately. It's not 2-chlorotoluene, it's 2-chloromethylbenzene. Okay, the ones to keep in, and, and you know, when I showed you that list before, I sort of narrowed it down. The ones to keep in mind that I think are especially important are um, in terms of naming, let me just show you this list again. So phenol and aniline, those will keep their special name, names as well as benzaldehyde and benzoic acid. Okay, uh, these two right here, I feel like especially are just something that you should have kind of hardened in your mind somewhere. All right, um, and then the last one. So again, this one's a little bit special. There's two methyl groups on there. So you call it 1,3-dimethylbenzene, but more commonly what you're going to see is this name right here, xylene. 
All right, this isn't anything that I'm gonna throw at you on the exam, but like, if you remember, we actually used xylene in, in the lab back, back when we used to do that sort of fun stuff. Um, but yeah, so xylene is a benzene ring that has two methyl groups on there. You can have orthoxylene, paraxylene, or metaxylene, right? That's just gonna designate how far apart those two methyl groups are. Okay, so when you have two substituents, you're just always gonna number in terms of alphabetical order. All right, so now moving on, when you have three substituents, this gets to be a little bit more of a pain in the butt, because remember the first rule of our nomenclature was we wanna have the, uh, the lowest possible numbering scheme, okay? So in this case here, even though bromo comes first in alphabetical order, if I start numbering at my bromo, there's no way to do it that I'm gonna get a smaller numbering scheme than the current way it currently is, right? So if I start numbering at bromo, that means that the bromine's at position one, the nitro's at position two, and the chlorine's at position five. Well, that's not gonna work because the other way, if I start numbering at the nitro, I have a one, two, four, right? So getting these smallest numbers is the first thing that you're sort of after when you're doing your nomenclature, okay? Um, so yeah, so the correct numbering scheme here would be to start at the nitro, so that gets one, then the bromine gets two, and your chlorine gets four. Okay, that's the only way that you can number it, sort of to keep the numbers the smallest. So everybody practice on these two rings here, see if you can't figure out how you number these correctly. All right. So again, here the key thing is you just wanna wind up with the lo lowest possible numbering scheme that you could get, right? So the best way to do it is to start with one for the chlorine, two for the nitro, four for the bromine, right? So the way that you list these when you name them is still in alphabetical order, but you're not numbering them in alphabetical order. Because again, if I started with the bromine, this would be one, two, three, four, so I'd wind up with one, three, four that way. That's bigger than one, two, four. Right, so again, the, the whole goal is to get the smallest possible numbering scheme. So same thing over here, we would start numbering and go around that way. Again, to get the one, two, four. Okay. And then lastly, now we have to deal with the ones that have our sort of special rings in there. Um, again, this chunk right here, this was benzoic acid, right? So that means that this guy gets to be position one, right? If you're one of those special groups, so aniline, the NH2 would get position one. Phenol, the OH group would get position one. Benzoic acid, that carboxylic acid group gets to be position one. And then everything else gets numbered again in such a way to keep the numbering scheme as small as possible. But here the only way to do that is, all right, so this is 5-bromo, 2-nitro-benzoic acid. 
Um, so everybody take a second and go structure to name and name the structure for these two guys here. Eric, can you hear now? You good? Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it was giving me a lot of trouble um, for about 20 minutes. Uh, but yeah, I can. everything's good now. Cool. I'll put the recording up on Canvas too, so you can listen to whatever you missed. Thank you. Whenever you're naming the one on the left, would the um, would putting benzene in in the name be necessary since phenol already implies the benzene ring? Correct. No. Yeah, you don't put benzene in the in the name. The phenol is its own special thing. Right. And again, because it's a phenol derivative, that OH group is what gets to be carbon one. All right, and for the last one, again, since it's aniline, that amine group gets position one. And then we go number everything else in such a way that winds up with the smallest possible numbering scheme. So again, just to sort of like drive this home, the reason why I wouldn't start numbering the other way is because this is one, four, six, whereas my black numbering scheme was one, two, four. All right. No, whatever. Okay. All right. So now we're going to talk about what happens with our electrophilic uh, aromatic substitution reactions when there's already a substituent on the ring, right? Everything that we did before, we talked about those five substitution reactions, the one that we reviewed at the very beginning, that was all starting out with a naked benzene ring. What we're going to find is that some substituents, will activate that benzene ring, make it more prone to substitution type reactions. These are substituents that donate electrons, okay? So in your mind, you wanna start thinking donate equals activate, right? Substituents that donate electrons will activate the benzene ring, make it more prone to electrophilic substitution reactions. And on the other hand, we have the exact opposite when we have electron withdrawing groups. These will deactivate our benzene ring, make it less prone to these electrophilic substitution reactions. All right, so now you want to think withdraw equals deactivate. Can anybody like just, you know, before we move on here, try to think of, give me a good reason as to why an electron donating group would activate these benzenes, make them more prone to these electrophilic substitutions? Resonance? Definitely, definitely part of it there, yeah. But withdrawing groups will also have resonance associated with them, right? So not only is it just, it's not as simple as just resonance, there's something special about the resonance. But even more simply, let's think about, right, I'm just sort of trying to give you guys tricks to keep in mind here. Let's say that, oh, I guess I should use the same thing here. Here's my electron donating group. It's going to be in a reaction with some electrophile here. What's the nucleophile in this reaction? The benzene, the benzene ring, right? What is our 
property of good nucleophiles? Are they electron rich or electron poor? They're um, electron rich. They're electron rich, right? So my benzene ring is going to be the nucleophile. If I have a substituent that donates electrons, that makes that benzene ring even more electron rich, right? An even better nucleophile because now there's more electrons being dumped into that resonance network that's in the ring, right? So again, just sort of like a little trick, you know, if you are on an exam and you're like, oh crap, which one's which here? Just take a step back and think about what role the benzene's playing. Well, it's gotta be a nucleophile. If it's got even more electrons, then it's even more electron rich, right? An even better nucleophile. Like halogens would make it more reactive. So we're we're gonna go down the list here in a second and see like uh, so yeah so let me just show you real quick the punchline here. We're gonna learn about all these different substituents here. All right, we're gonna find that some of them are activating strongly, some of them are weakly activating, some of them are blah 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 blah. This list is big and ugly when you're looking at it now, but we're going to go sort of one by one and realize that it's they're not too scary here. But this is kind of the punchline here that we're getting at is we're going to go through different groups, see which ones are activating, i.e. which ones donate electrons, and which ones are deactivating, i.e. which ones withdraw electrons. Another thing that we're going to see just to sort of keep in mind, we're going to find that our activating groups are orthoparadirecting. All right, so if you have an activating substitu uh, substitute, it will direct where that next uh, substituent is going to go on that ring. Likewise, we're going to see with our deactivating groups, they are meta directing. All right, and we'll see why this all is in a second, but just sort of to give everybody like the punchline or, or sort of where we're going with all this. All right, so first of all, first thing we're going to go to is our strongly activating substituents. All right, so again, these are going to be groups that donate electrons and donate electrons really well. Okay, everybody take a second and pick, pick one of these, right? So first of all, we have um, amine groups, alcohol groups, and ether groups. These are all going to be uh, donating groups. See if you can't give me one of the resonance structures that you would get, uh, you know, that, that sort of proves that these guys are in fact donating groups. All right, so draw me another resonance contributor for alanine here. Test one. What up? Just one of the contributors? Yeah, though just one of them's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll do the other one. I just want to make sure we all remember how this is going to go, right? So these are going to be donating groups because that pair of electrons, either on the nitrogen or the oxygen, can be donated to that group, uh, to that benzene ring. So if we just sort of drew this resonance contributor here. All right, and then if I wanted to go one more, this pair of electrons would come down and form a new bond, and this pair would jump onto that carbon there. All right, so those are two of my resonance structures that I would get. I can have one more if I wanted to bounce that pair of electrons again. Notice that here, my carbocation, not carbocation, sorry, my carbanion is located at which, which position, ortho, meta, or para? Ortho. Yep. And what about in my next structure here, ortho, meta, or para? Meta. 
not meta no Wait, so one? meta would be this this guy here this is actually oh, that's all right, so again, what we're going to see is these activating groups are ortho and para directing. All right, and so here's just a, a bit of a good argument as to why that is, because now we have this negative charge concentrated on either my ortho or para carbons, right? And again, it's those, that benzene rings acting as a nucleophile, so more electron density, better nucleophile. Okay, so these are all of my strongly activating groups. Uh, they all have electrons that they can donate to this benzene ring. Okay, let's see some moderately activating groups. Okay, this would be an amide or what do we call these guys here? Wait, which ones? This one. What's this group on our, my benzene ring here? That's an ester. Ester, awesome. All right, so amide or ester groups, these carboxylic acid derivatives, they are only moderately activating, okay? Notice that they do still have a pair of electrons that they can donate, right? So then, just like before, Whoops, now I have. All right, so it's still donating, but it's only moderately so. Why is that? Why don't they donate as well as just a regular? Why does an amide group not donate quite as well as a regular old amine group? Is it because there's another side to it? Or yeah, close. I, uh, I think I know where Less you're going. Hydrogen? It's not the hydrogens, actually. It's just that it there's doesn't. another resonance structure available to this molecule here that doesn't donate to the ring. This pair of electrons also can come over here. So there's yet another resonance structure that's sort of in conflict with our donating to the ring sort of deal. So I, I thought when you had more resonance structures, it was more stable. Right, but I'm not taught, now I'm not, this is not about, you know, free energy stability of a molecule. This is how reactive that benzene ring is. Oh, okay. Okay. This resonance structure right here, okay. the other one that's available because it's an amide, does nothing to activate that ring, right? Activating the ring is all about putting electrons into the benzene ring itself. I have, one of my resonance structures does that. That's why this group is moderately activating. But the other resonance structure doesn't. So that's why it's not strongly activated. Okay. All right, that pair of electrons can go either towards the ring, but it can also go away from the ring into that amide group. Same thing with your ester, you have that same problem. So there's just two resonance structures available. One does help the ring, the other one doesn't. All right, so these are our moderately activating groups. Weakly activating groups would just be either an alkyl group, an alkene group, or another benzene ring. They are still activating, but only weakly. Uh, that is because... Um, Not daily. So what? Not daily. What did I say? Oh, weekly. <laughs> boom, boom. Um, Wait, now I got thrown off. Yeah, okay. So first of all, uh, in terms of the weakly activating groups here, your alkyl group doesn't have any sort of resonance structures to contribute, right? It only donates electrons by hyperconjugation. That's where the uh, bonding orbital is overlapping with uh, anti-bonding orbital sort of stuff. That weird thing that I told you is gonna come up over and over again has that oddly stabilizing effect um, you do have electron donating through resonance with an uh, with a vinyl group or an aryl group. The problem is you also have electron with uh, withdrawing through those resonance effects as well, right? So those resonance structures go both ways. 
So the net effect is it is activating, but only weakly. All right. Withdrawing groups or deactivating groups. So first of all, your halogens. And this may be a little bit confusing because these guys have a ton of pairs of electrons that they can donate to the group through resonance. The problem is, is that all of your halogens are also very strongly electronegative. So although they will donate electrons through resonance, the net effect, of, the more important effect is actually the withdrawing that they do by induction, um, which is basically by virtue of being very electronegative. All right, so they both like have this push-pull effect. Uh, the net effect though is that they're actually deactivating. All right, so our halogens are electron withdrawing groups. Only weakly so. All right, moderately deactivating groups uh, would be carbonyl groups located directly next to the ring. All right, so why are these deactivating groups? Well, because this pair of electrons from the ring can be pulled out of that benzene ring and stabilized through resonance, right? So if we, everybody take a second and actually draw me the structure that you would get from that. All right, so notice that our electron withdrawing groups are deactivating groups. They also have put it, you know, through resonance, put a charge on that ring, but now it's a positive charge. Remember, we want benzene to play the role of a nucleophile. We don't want a positive charge bouncing around that ring. That's only going to make it less prone to these electrophilic aromatic substitution type reactions where benzene's playing a nucleophile. Right, so again, these deactivating groups are withdrawing electrons, making benzene a less potent nucleophile. All right, so any of these, any of the carbonyl groups located directly next to the ring will have that same effect. These are going to be our moderately deactivating groups. Okay. Strongly deactivating groups are going to be the nitro group, right? So both the nitro and our sulfonium group here, both of those, right? We, we, first of all, we learned how we can create these two compounds here. We sort of reviewed it at the very beginning. Those are both strongly deactivating substituents. Okay, um, and you can just see, I think, by virtue of the structure of the nitro group here, right, and in a nitro group, the nitrogen has four bonds, so it has a positive charge associated with it. Um, the net charge is zero because the oxygen has a negative charge, okay, but nonetheless, this makes it incredibly uh, electron withdrawing, willing to accept that pair of electrons from the benzene ring. Um, yeah, same with the sulfonium group. Uh, the other one would be a nitrile group is strongly electron withdrawing. As well as when you have a protonated amine. 
or an ammonium group, I guess it would really would it be what it was called. All right, but any sort of a positive charge located directly next to that ring will have that effect as well, being electron withdrawing. Okay. So again, let's just sort of, uh, this was our big master list here, which I know is big and ugly, but let's just sort of go through. It's not as bad as it seems. So just to review, right, these guys here, these are our strongly activating groups, either amine groups, alcohol groups, or ester groups, basically when you have a nitrogen or oxygen that can donate a pair of electrons to that ring. Those are strongly activating. If you have amide or ester, those are moderately activating. They can still uh, donate electrons through resonance. The problem is, is that they also have that other resonance structure that doesn't donate electrons to the ring, so they're only moderately activating. And then weakly activating would be either alkyl group groups, aryl groups, or vinyl groups. And again, those are ortho para directing compounds. We'll, we'll sort of even prove this even more by looking at all the different resonance structures. But as we saw before, they put that negative charge on either the ortho or the para carbon, making them that much better nucleophiles. So kind of just a general rule of thumb, if you want to see if something is activating or deactivating, you can just draw the res resonance contributor. Yeah, yeah totally. If there's a know. negative charge bouncing around that ring, that means it's activating. If there's a positive charge bouncing around that ring, that's deactivating. What happened to meta in the ortho para? So, what was, so the bottom line is that some of these substituents will lead to substitution reactions that are either or, that are ortho para directing. The other ones are meta directing. Right, so our activating groups are ortho para directing, our deactivating groups are meta directing. Okay, and again, we're gonna look at a bunch of different resonance structures to sort of like prove that, but that's, that's the gist here. Uh, again, our, so then just to, and this is all of course, when we're talking about this, the standard of comparison here is hydrogen or just a naked benzene ring, right? So now we're comparing when there's a hydrogen there that's gonna be substituted versus you know, if there are all these other groups on there. Remember our halogens, those are weakly deactivating because they're really electronegative. We have moderately deactivating groups. These are all have carbonyls located directly next to the ring. Those can withdraw electrons through resonance. And then we have our strongly deactivating groups um, right, so you have, importantly, the nitrile group, all of these are just your protonated amines or amino, uh, not amino, sorry, uh, ammonium groups, right? So you have a nitrogen that has a positive charge that's going to be strongly deactivating, as well as two things that are semi-unique to this chapter, because we learned how to prepare benzenes that have those groups on them through sulfonation or nitration. All right, so a nitro group is a strongly deactivating group. All right, well, so, so like, what exactly does this mean? Again, that means if I take, remember this is a weird one, this is toluene, and then I undergo these halogenation reactions, so that's using um, iron three bromide and liquid bromine Br2, right? We know that those will, undergo electrophilic uh, aromatic substitution reactions. Well, when we have a methyl group on our ring, this is one of our, let's just go back to our little cheat sheet here. This is one of our weakly deactivating groups. So it's ortho para directing, right? So when we have that methyl group on our ring and we undergo these reactions, we get two different products out of them, the ortho and the para, we don't get any meta product. Right, so that's what it means to be ortho directing, para directing, meta directing. It's where that next substitute is going to be on the ring. Again, this guy here, this is weakly activating, and activating is ortho para. 
All right, so I guess real quick, just to summarize in our minds what we want to think here. Uh, electron donating, activating, ortho para directing, whoops. These are all one and the same thing, right? If you're electron donating, that means that you're activating, which means that you're gonna be ortho para director. If you're electron withdrawing, that's deactivating and that is meta directing okay so those are just like your quick associations you want to have in your mind so again when we have toluene that methyl group is weakly activating so then when I react that with bromine and iron three bromide, I get an ortho product and a para product. Likewise, if I take my nitro group, this one was strongly deactivating, meaning it was meta directing. And thus when I react that with bromine and iron three bromide, I get my meta isomer no ortho or para. For the ortho um, and para isomers, will there be like a percentage of each one or will it be? 50 yeah, totally. 50? That's sort of what we're building to. We'll see that in a second. For now, just, just hammering home, activating or electron donating, you want to think ortho para products, deactivating or electron withdrawing, you want to think your meta. Okay. What time is it? Uh, okay. So now let's. So we can we can sort of uh, argue exactly why that is by looking at all the different possible resonance structures in each of these cases, right? So again, we're going to take what's called anisole. This isn't one of the ones that I'm I'm going to expect you guys to know, but nonetheless, that's the special name for when you have a methyl ether. And we're going to look at what happens when we have the ortho substitution, right? So just a reminder, these are my ortho positions, these are my meta positions, and these are my para positions, right? So what happens to each of these? Um, what, we're gonna look at all the resonance structures that are available when each of these are added, okay? So first of all is what happens when I put my electrophile in the ortho position. Right, here's one of my resonance structures here. Actually, everybody take a second and see if you can't give me what the other resonance structures are. There are three other ones available. All right, so not only can I have the carbocation stabilized by the benzene ring, that's what we saw in all of our uh, electrophilic aromatic, aromatic substitution reactions, I have a fourth resonance structure available because this is an electron donating group where that positive charge is on the oxygen, right? So that electron donating group can help stabilize that carbocation when we have addition to the ortho position. When you have addition to the meta position, again, bounce that carbocation around the ring, 
there is no opportunity for that electron donating group to stabilize that carbocation. Right? Remember, these carbocations on this benzene ring, that's going to be an intermediate in all of these electrophilic aromatic substitution reactions. Right? So what we've seen is that in the ortho, we can help stabilize that carbocation. In the meta, that possibility doesn't exist. And then in the para position, we have the same thing that we saw with the ortho. Eventually, that carbocation can work its way to this carbon here, allowing for an additional resonance structure that's going to stabilize that positive charge. Right, so again, when you have the para and ortho substitutions, you have that additional resonance structure to help stabilize that carbocation. You don't have that with the meta, right? So that's why donating is ortho and para directing, All right? Donating equals activating equals ortho para directing. All right, and then obviously, so, well, not obviously, but where we're going with this is uh, when you have electron withdrawing groups, you see the exact opposite phenomenon, okay? So now again, I'm gonna take, now we have a protonated alanine. Remember these ammonium groups, these protonated nitrogens are extremely electron withdrawing groups. And we're gonna see here that now the meta is going to be more stabilized. So let's just go through. And see, right? So when you have a um, when you have substitution in the ortho position, that means that you're going to have a carbocation located directly next to that positively charged nitrogen. That is incredibly unfavorable, right? So the problem here is you have a less stable carbocation because of that electron withdrawing group. You have your other resonance structures available as well. But again, the, the bad one is when you have your positive charge located right next to another positive charge, right? Your positively charged carbocation located right next to the positively charged nitrogen. If you have meta substitution, you don't ever run into that problem when you draw all the resonance structures, right? You never have a situation where the carbocation is located directly next to your electron withdrawing group. Likewise, when I have my para substituent, again, I'm going to be able to bounce that carbocation around and get to a structure where the positive charge is located directly next to that group. That is, again, not good. Okay. Now, this would be true even if instead of being like a protonated alanine, you know, I think that using a protonated alanine was a good example because you can see positive charge located next to positive charge that's bad. Not all of our electron withdrawing groups have that positive charge, but nonetheless, what does it mean to be electron withdrawing? It means to be electron deficient, right? So these are just atoms that are extremely electron deficient and you don't want to have carbocations located directly next to electron deficient groups. Okay, so that is why these electron withdrawing groups are meta directing. You said electron withdrawing groups are electron deficient? Yeah, like if you're an electron withdrawing group, so for example, a positive charge here, it's because you yourself are electron deficient. That's why you're able to pull electrons to yourself because you don't have a bunch of them, right? If you're electron rich, rich, you're not going to be withdrawing electrons, right? Okay. So all these electron withdrawing groups have this effect of either having a net positive charge or like, you know, basically being a partial positive charge. They're, they're, they're relatively electron deficient. All right, so that's, uh, that's going to do it for today. We'll jump into some, like, seeing these, you know, going through more specific reactions and seeing the ortho para directing products and talking about distributions and all that stuff next time. Um, for now, you know, we can end with this. The big thing, I think, the good summary of what we learned today being this here. And I know this is a big, ugly list, but it really isn't too bad when you start picking through it. All right, again, this, this sort of uh, 
these two right here being really important, right? Should be able to identify whether your substituent is electron withdrawing or electron donating, and that'll tell you whether it's activating and orthoparadirecting or deactivating and metadirecting. Okay? All right, so I will get you guys emailed your exams. They're gonna be marked up, like I, I downloaded them and put them in PDF form and marked them up on my iPad and stuff like that. Um, and I'll type up an email that's uh, explaining sort of how the curve's gonna work as well as how points are gonna be made up. Um, the bottom line is, is that when you take your final exam, there will be certain portions dedicated to exam one, exam two, exam three, exam four type questions. And depending on how you do on that section, it can boost your grade for the exam too. So, right, so if you do really well on the final exam for the portion that's dedicated to exam two questions, I'll have that bump up your exam two score. All right, but I'll put, I'll put all this in an email. And again, I'm gonna sign on an hour early on Thursday. So if you guys have any questions on your exam or how that curve works or whatever, you can sign on a little early on Thursday and we can talk about it. Cool? All right, I'll see you all then. Um, yeah, keep it up. Again, I know it's really easy to skip class in this format, but you know, just keep it up, finish out the semester strong. All right, good luck, be safe. Um, I have, I sent you a message um, on the chat here. Uh, on the group chat? On the private chat for you? Yeah, it didn't show up. Usually it comes in the same sort of format, but um, yeah, I don't see it. Maybe Do I have on the controller, computer. Say it again? The, the other computer, she sent it to the other computer. Oh, you're right. Okay, I see. Okay, well, uh, hold on. Good call, Carlo.